Uh, hello, and welcome to the webinar series of the ITU Journal on Future and Evolving Technologies. My name is Alessio Magliarditi from ITU, the International Telecommunication Union. ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies. ITU allocates frequencies to the services that make use of the radio communication spectrum. It develops standards and assists developing countries in setting up their information and communication infrastructure. ITU and academia share a commitment to the public interest. And this commitment is embodied by the ITU Journal, which offers complete coverage of communication and networking paradigms free of charge for both readers and authors. Our journal works on submissions at any time on any topic within its scope. And we believe that this webinar series launched in March this year will inspire more contributions from researchers around the world. It is my pleasure to open today the webinar with Professor Ness Schroff from The Ohio State University. Um, and we count on your support to make this webinar an interesting experience. So please submit your question via the Q&A channel and we will address them to the speaker during the Q&A session. And uh, after the talk and the Q&A, please stay online. We have something special for you. The Wisdom Corner, live life lessons. Professor Schroff agreed to a personal chat. He will share with us today some lessons learned over the years that might perhaps be useful for some of you. It is my pleasure now to uh, introduce Professor Iana Kilditz, the moderator of the Q&A session, editor-in-chief of the ITU Journal on Future and Evolving Technologies, and also um, the president and founder of Truva from the United States. So Professor Akilditz is Ken Byers Chair Professor in Telecommunication Emeritus at the Georgia Institute of Technologies. He's editor-in-chief emeritus of Impact Factor Journals, highly cited and at the top of the most prestigious international rankings. He's visiting distinguished professors in several universities around the world. His current research interests include 6G and 7G wireless networks, hologram communications, bio nanothings, molecular communications, um, intelligent surfaces, and many other subjects. So, Professor Akilditz, the floor is yours to give your welcome uh, remarks and to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alessia. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening worldwide from Abu Dhabi. Uh, I welcome you all to the second season of our ITU Journal for Future and Evolving Technologies webinar series. I have the immense pleasure to introduce you one of the leading researchers in our era and a true friend of mine, Dr. Ness Shroff. Ness has over 25 years a super career. He received his PhD degree from Columbia University in 1994 when Columbia University was the leading unit in telecommunication uh, through the Center for Telecommunication uh, led by Tom Stern and Misha Schwartz and Tony Acampora. I still remember those years. And the Ness joined Purdue University immediately as an assistant professor. At Purdue, he became a full professor of the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering and director of Center for Wireless Systems and Applications in 2004. And my our roads crossed many, many times with Ness. One of them was through that center, and he invited me to serve on the advisory board, and I visited him many times, as well as he visited me at Georgia Tech many, many times, and, and we met at many other occasions. In July 2007, Ness joined the EC and the CSE departments at the Ohio State University as the Ohio Eminent Scholar Chair Professor in Networking and Communications. Ness also uh, has a guest chair professor of wireless communications at Tsinghua University, Beijing, China from 2009 to 2012. And currently he holds an honorary guest professor at Shanghai Jiatong University in China and visiting position at the Institute of Indian Institute of Technology in Mumbai or Bombay. And uh, Ness research interests span the areas of communications, networking, computing, storage, cloud uh, recommender, social and cyber physical systems. 
He's especially interested in fundamental problems in machine learning, design, control, performance, pricing, and security of these complex systems. Ness also serves uh, the community in many, many capacities. For example, he is editor-in-chief of the ACM, IEEE ACM transactions and networking. And also he is on the steering committee uh, board and also chair of the ACM Mobi Hub conference. And he also served many, many IEEE and ACM conferences, the leading and prestigious ones like Infocom and Mobihawk. And also he served many journals uh, on their editorial boards. Ness is an excellent speaker. Accordingly, he gives and gave uh, many, many keynote addresses. Also, I had involved him uh, at uh, conferences that I organized and had invited him as keynote speaker. And uh, so uh, he also uh, has uh, many awards. Uh, for example, he is an IEEE fellow and uh, also a recipient of National Science Foundation Career Award. Uh, his papers receive numerous awards like uh, IEEE, Infocom 6, 8, and 16, and the best paper uh, of the year award from many journals. And uh, so uh, he is overall an excellent researcher. I respect him since the beginning. I met him back in 1997. Uh, he was a young fellow and he came, he asked me to uh, be involved in the technical program committee of, I can't remember, uh, Infocom. And I said, of course. And then since then we are very close friends and uh, I'm really proud that uh, he became one of the top researchers in the field. And, and Ness is on the list of highly cited researchers. And uh, so uh, like, uh, you know, this uh, most influential, uh, world's most influential scientific minds in 2014 and 15. And uh, he, as I told you, he, met, he received many, many awards, including Infocom Achievement Award in 2014. And uh, I think uh, I should start to stop here. And uh, as a, a final note, let me express my sincere thanks to Ness for accepting our invitation and giving the speech, which is entitled AI Edge Designing Future XG Networks and Distributed Intelligence. Again, uh, Ness, thanks a lot. And the uh, stage is yours. We look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ian. Uh, I greatly appreciate the kind introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be here. And uh, uh, let me begin by, by sharing my screen and then I hope uh, everything works out. Okay, let's see. Okay, is my screen visible to everyone? Yes, very good. All right, perfect. All right, so. As I said earlier, it's really my pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, I'm Nesh Shroff and uh, I'm, the, uh, I'm at the Ohio State University and I'm also the Institute Director of a very exciting new uh, uh, NSF AI Institute uh, called AI Edge, uh, which is focused on uh, designing future edge uh, uh, networks, uh, such as XG networks, uh, as well as distributed intelligence. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go over this outline uh, uh, relatively quickly. I plan to spend roughly about half of the talk uh, describing the research agenda of this new institute, uh, primarily because I think it will be of uh, interest to the broader community. I'll sort of talk about some specific you know, open questions in, in various thrusts uh, uh, and so on. And then uh, I'll spend roughly the other uh, half of the time on a particular use case study where I will show how uh, AI and in particular uh, online learning uh, is important in improving uh, systems, uh, system performance. Uh, uh, so let me begin by saying you know, a, a story. So while I was preparing for our institute kickoff about a year ago, 
uh, uh, someone sent me a video where the great Len Kleinrock, who, by the way, is a great friend of uh, Ian Achilles, I know, uh, was uh, recalling a conversation that he himself had uh, with another uh, great leader in our field, Richard Hamming, uh, about why uh, so few scientists are remembered for their work. Uh, and Hamming's answer was that they don't work on important enough problems. Uh, so taking this lesson to heart, uh, we should all uh, uh, do our best uh, to make a contribution, uh, not only that will be remembered by writing yet another paper, but hopefully be remembered uh, uh, decades from now. Uh, and this is how we have ch you know, charged this institute, and we are all very excited uh, uh, to be part of this journey, which is really an opportunity uh, of a lifetime. So you're, let me begin with the Institute vision. Uh, so as all of you I'm sure know, uh, networking and artificial intelligence are two of the most transformative information technologies. Uh, these technologies have helped uh, uh, improve people's lives, contributed to national economic competitiveness, national security, uh, and, and national uh, uh, defense. So the overarching vision uh, of uh, our research efforts in this area is to exploit the synergies between AI and networks uh, to create not only a research, but also an education, a knowledge transfer and workforce development environment uh, that will go towards helping reestablish uh, US leadership in future generation edge networks and hopefully distributed AI uh, uh, for many decades to come. And we hope that this Institute vis vision is ambitious enough uh, to pass the Hamming uh, Klein Rock test. So this address, you know, the various challenges that are, uh, are, are you know, are, are present in, uh, you know, uh, designing the future of XG systems. Uh, this Institute is made of a strong uh, and diverse consortia of lead research leaders from various universities, industry, and government labs. Uh, uh, the, the goal will be that these will all work collaboratively uh, uh, to realize this overall vision. So we have 11 universities in the, in the US, and now we have gone global. We have uh, three of the top Korean universities as part of this group, uh, KAIST, SNU, and Korea University, as well as IIT Bombay and IIT Madras. All right, so this figure uh, gives you an idea of really the scope of the research that I'm going to talk about and what uh, we mean by the network edge. So, you know, the, the tautology is that everything outside of the core, I guess, of the internet is the edge. Right, so this is sort of a very geeky and precise definition, but doesn't kind of tell you anything. Uh, but what we really mean by XG networks and the edge networks is all you know wireless networks such as camera networks, drone swarms, vehicular networks, robotic networks, cellular networks, etc. Uh, these are all part of this XG ecosystem and the edge ecosystem. Uh, and also, you know, the, the smaller data centers, not the very, very large, you know, uh, uh, data centers that are, that, are, that are part of the core uh, are also part of, part of the edge. And the reason why I feel that researchers should focus uh, uh, more on the edge is because of two reasons. Number one, this is where we expect most of the explosive growth to take place thanks to, you know, IoT and other devices. Uh, and also the second reason is that the edge <clears throat> is an area that is, let's say, less affected uh, by legacy standards. So you can do more innovative works uh, that can have a, have a real impact. So this, in this figure, you can see that the bottom layer really corresponds to the physical uh, network, while the top layer corresponds to the intelligence substrate or the superstrate uh, uh, that controls it. So, so and, and our goal is really to sort of develop this distributed intelligence uh, uh, top layer. <laughs> so the research plan of the Institute is organized across eight thrusts that span 
two uh, broad symbiotic areas. I'll talk about each of them in a little bit more detail. One, the, the first area is AI for networks, which corresponds to thrust one through four. Uh, and uh, the second one is uh, uh, networks for AI, which corresponds to thrust uh, five through eight. Uh, and to, uh, you know, one of the things that we in academia do really well, and as a theorist, that has been much, much of my focus, uh, but to make sure that our foundational research is grounded in reality, uh, what we have done is uh, to, we've, we've developed, you know, different important wireless use cases uh, that our research tasks uh, will, will explore. And the idea is that these research tasks will be you know, further enhanced and fleshed out by exploring these uh, uh, use cases. You know, the first one being you know, sensing and networking combined, the interactions between machines, humans, and mobility, and the third one being you know, programmable uh, virtualized networks. Uh, and while these use cases, as I mentioned, are important in their own right, uh, we have already started to think how to connect them uh, uh, to key research, uh, to key uh, experimental platforms. So, you know, some of them are government platforms like, you know, the various power platforms, as well as industry platforms of all the various industries uh, 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 and, and uh, th that are part of our, our consortium. All right. So you, I'm gonna list three differentiators of the Institute, but this is not really meant to be an advertisement for the Institute. It's rather some key differentiators that I feel are critically important for doing work in this area. So right now it's, it's very, very fashionable to apply machine learning or AI to everything that you design, right? But if you look at the plethora of networking papers, for example, that use AI, what they typically do is they take an off-the-shelf AI, you know, usually a neural network, they train it and apply it to a networking problem. And then they say, okay, well, you know, you see some improvement and, and we are done. However, while you know, AI has been enormously successful and we have a real opportunity to use it to design uh, uh, edge networks. The reality is that the applications that AI has been applied to are quite different from networks. I mean, networks are very dynamic beasts. They're very complex beasts. They require uh, you know, uh, handling constraints which are not typical in AI systems. You know, these are hard constraints like power constraints, et cetera. You, know, you have uh, to, to account for the fact that you have mobility, you have you know, information arrivals and departures and, and, and so on and so forth. So I strongly believe that simply applying known AI techniques to these networking problems is the wrong approach. Instead, what we want to do is to develop new foundational AI that takes into account these various network characteristics, such as you know, power controls, uh, you know, interference, scheduling, you know, uh, network dynamics, as, as well as the decades of domain knowledge that we all as experts in the field have built up. You cannot simply throw this away and then use a black box and then declare victory. The other uh, 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 important aspect of, of, of this institute and, 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 and research, uh, which I think is very promising, is that because of this tremendous growth in the edge uh, uh, devices, uh, there is no question that the future of AI uh, is going to be in distributed AI. And so we can think of this in two ways. One is that we basically, you know, use the distributed AI like it is done right now, where, you know, your iPhones, your, 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 your uh, end devices currently have some, you know, app, app that uses a machine learning tool, but doesn't really interact uh, uh, with each other or doesn't interact with the network, or you basically create an environment where these different uh, uh, ML agents that are in, in different edge devices can interact with each other through 
a, a smart network. So here, what we need to do is we need to develop AI aware networks and network aware AI in order to sort of unleash the power of collaboration uh, to solve large scale distributed AI problems, which are very, very important uh, in, in the future. And finally, uh, you know, I will briefly mention this notion of a virtuous cycle. So as I've, I've mentioned, you know, I'm a, a theorist, but a critical component of what we will be doing is to help to shorten the time scales bet of interactions between foundations and use case research across multiple disciplines, hopefully that results in this what we call virtuous cycle that will have a cascading impact that dramatically accelerates the time it takes uh, uh, for the research to go from foundations to implementation and tech transfer. And to that end, in year one, there have been several examples of works that uh, have been done in this institute that have actually seen a large scale experimentation. So let me briefly introduce you uh, uh, to the research thrusts and some of for some of the thrusts, uh, I think about four or five of them out of these eight, I'll, I'll go into a bit more depth about some interesting research open problems. Unfortunately, uh, given the time, I can't do it for, for all of them. All right, so we begin at the physical layer. And so the, in the first thrust, the goal is how do we re-engineer the physical fabric itself? How do we expand the constraint set if you're a mathematician, okay? So the idea here is how can we use, you know, physics-based approaches to sort of re-engineer the physical fabric uh, uh, and, you know, use the fabric as a controllable entity and also expand uh, the capacity region. So let me give you two sort of example research challenges in a bit more, more depth. So the first challenge is how do we leverage uh, 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 physical knowledge uh, in order to uh, you know, design uh, uh, you know, better sort of uh, 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 you know, uh, a better communications medium. So the motivation is that physics-based knowledge have often been used to solve complex problems. They've also recently been used in uh, uh, you know, neural network uh, 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 types of, uh, of, uh, of settings where you sort of leverage meaningful physical models into a neural network in order to uh, speed up prediction. So big question is when we are designing uh, our edge networks, can such models uh, uh, be used, for example, to better estimate, you know, certain parameters that might be of Im Im important, multipath component, mobility, you know, make initial guesses, provide sort of boundary conditions. So the exploration that takes place is, is not done unfettered. It's sort of done in a way in which the physics dictates it so that you converge to the solutions much quicker. Right. These are actually quite hard problems. And initially we had some you know, ideas that, okay, if you start with an initial condition that's perhaps closer to the optimal, it'll automatically result in, in, in much faster uh, convergence. It's not true, but there are some very complex issues related to that. I'm happy to chat about them. Um, the other aspect is can physics-based models be integrated with machine learning tools to help make better decisions? So, for example, you know, for online learning, you know, you can use uh, it with sort of, you know, physics-based constraints to do better beam searching, beam forming, uh, uh, et cetera. The second uh, important research challenge that I want to talk about here, and there are, of course, many in this thrust, is how do you use this physics-based knowledge to discover efficient codes in communication systems uh, via machine learning. So the, the key motivation for this problem, and, and coding, by the way, is sort of the fundamental building block of communication, right? Uh, and so, so the, 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 the key motivation is that developing efficient codes, if you look at the history of how, you know, coding has, prog you know, uh, uh, codes have, have progressed over the last 30 to 40 years, 
they sort of primarily go along the line of incremental advances with occasional breakthroughs that happen because of human ingenuity, you know? Think of turbo quotes, for example, you know, think of Gallagher's original papers. Uh, so these, these things happen very rarely. They typically happen on linear quotes. And so the big challenge here is can machine learning be used to expedite discovery and perhaps, you know, even use something like deep neural networks to expand the search space to also include uh, nonlinear codes. And so there are some very interesting questions here. For one, once you get into the nonlinear codes, the number of code words is extremely large. You have generalization issues like you normally do with machine learning tools where training at one SNR and perhaps a small block length does not easily generalize to other SNRs and, and larger block lengths. And so to overcome these challenges, domain knowledge from communication, coding, information theories is critical. So knowing the physics of the problem is, is very, very critical to making advances. And there are some very exciting new works, uh, 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 you know, primarily pioneered by Sewong Oh and his group at University of Washington in designing these low latency nonlinear codes. Uh, and, a research area that you know I, I strongly recommend folks who are interested in the physical uh, uh, layer uh, to look into carefully. So that second thrust is uh, really about resource allocation. And here our goal is to develop uh, new AI techniques for optimizing resources under this hopefully uh, expanded uh, constraint set. Right. So, you know, you're, there are issues of complexity that I'll talk about, you know, how to learn from, you know, incomplete uh, uh, network state information that I'll talk about. So let's again uh, discuss two examples in a, in a little bit more detail. So <coughs> machine learning is, is, is a great tool for prediction, but often needs a lot of data, a, a lot of information, uh, uh, and, and might take time. So a big challenge here is how does one design low complexity and especially sample efficient AI uh, network algorithms, right? So the idea is, you know, you, you basically want to develop new strategies to learn the environment very quickly and adapt to sort of non-stationary behavior, okay? But you also want to do this where the information content that you might be getting from your uh, wireless system, et cetera, might not be very data rich. So how do you make decisions when the number of samples that you're receiving is relatively low? How do you make design online learning tools when the computational resources that you have at the end users are relatively uh, limited? And what do you do when the information exchange channel itself uh, is, is, uh, is, is somewhat limited, right? So how does one design machine learning tools that have all these great features of you know, low complexity in terms of sample, compute, and communication, and also is able to handle things like non-stationary dynamics, hard and soft constraints, uh, distributed uh, 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 nature of these large network systems, potentially multiple uh, objectives and, and so on. So there is this wonderful area of Bayesian optimization, uh, you know, which, which, uh, which again, sort of, you know, do, you know one, can one can develop further to develop online tools that have these features. Uh, 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 you know, fantastic area to work on if you really want to, you know, learn about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, online learning and online reinforcement learning. Uh, especially if you're also interested in ensuring that the solutions that you develop, you know, have provable efficiencies, are safe, et cetera. Uh, another big challenge that happens here is what do you do when the network state information uh, is incomplete? Okay. So the, 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 the practical challenge is that many network control functions in reality cannot wait for all of the data to arrive before a decision needs to be made. So for example, right, you cannot uh, you know, tell a self-driving car, hey, let me wait uh, to make sure 
that you know I get all of my decisions before I tell you to make a left and not hit that wall, right? You 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 clearly cannot do that. Right, so you yeah, and, and even for simple things in in our, I mean, not simple, but in traditional network control, congestion control, for example, needs to be done on the order of you know milliseconds potentially, uh, or right, or, or or you know, or seconds at most, and you cannot wait for all of the data to arrive uh, before you 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 make this decision. So here one has to develop multi-scale machine learning tools uh, and how to do this efficiently, how to do this optimally is open. For example, one could use local data for real-time control, but then use historical global data to determine the policy uh, in an offline manner, right? Uh, and, you know, open questions are can, you know, these sorts of approaches, you know, perform well. You know, are they efficient? You know, are they near optimal? Can they be made scalable? All good questions to sort of look at. Uh, thrust three uh, is about dealing with multi-agents, possibly non-cooperative entities. So here the idea is the following. <clears throat> you know, while you may have developed wonderful techniques for optimizing individual agents, Okay, things may go quite badly if these optimized agents start to interact. For example, let's take a very mundane but important, uh, uh, you know, networking uh, uh, requirement, which is setting handover thresholds. Right? If you use, <coughs> um, uh, you know, you, you know, if you use the techniques that the single agents have have set for setting handover thresholds. And now you have multiple base stations interacting. These thresholds might be too low, uh, 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 you know, for uh, uh, you know for this distributed system, multi-cell system. So while it's perfect for a single cell, it could end up overloading uh, neighboring cells. And of course, the problem becomes much more exacerbated when these agents may be adversarial or competitive, you know, where you have Verizon and AT&T, you know, competing and, you know, you have this introduction of this very, you know, uh, uh, important and flourishing area, which is just right now people are looking into, which involves, you know, games and reinforcement learning. I'm not a security person, but uh, security is a very important piece in designing XG networks. And so thrust four is really about making sure that security is taken into the design of these networks from the ground up and not as an afterthought. And there are a variety of design problems where machine learning could be useful. You know, how do you analyze network protocol specifications, network protocol implementations? How do you detect anomalies, et cetera, using machine learning? A very important practical but meta question is how does one use machine learning or develop machine learning tools to create automated tools to ensure uh, security. And this is an area where it's quite a bit of work that started in our, our institute. And on a broader context, are there ways in which one can fundamentally characterize security performance trade-offs? Uh, this is a very open problem, very exciting problem, uh, and, and one where perhaps machine learning can, can help. All right, now we'll move to from, uh, uh, you know, AI for networks to our sort of second meta thrust, which has to do with networks for AI. So thrust five is really aimed at developing distributed AI tools uh, that are network aware and can coordinate uh, with the networks uh, themselves by taking into account, you know, the constraints that the network has, you know, computation, communication, data, et cetera. So let me again give you a couple of examples here. A big challenge in distributed machine learning is to do distributed optimization. So the question is, can we do network aware distributed optimization in order to further enhance uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the performance of the end uh, AI distributed applications? So your, the motivation comes from the following observation. 
If you look at traditional distributed machine learning like federated learning, et cetera, it A, assumes reliable communication and B, typically much of the work uh, assumes communication between a central aggregating server uh, and the worker nodes. However, if you look at edge networks, workers could be communication constrained devices at the edge, uh, you know, IoT sensors, cameras, et cetera. And the, the reliability might be suspect in terms of the connectivity. So the question is, what are the fundamental trade-offs that one can get between communication efficiency and making these machine learning applications better, making them converge faster? There's this very exciting work done by Gauri Joshi and, and so on uh, for, for an important class of problems, uh, 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 which is stochastic gradient descent, which shows that communication gains can be very substantial if you transmit infrequently when the distributed uh, uh, AI algorithms are far from convergence and you transmit much more often when they are closer to convergence. And this gives you order of magnitude improvement in communication gains. So the question is, can such insights be used to more general distributed machine learning tools? Can we design uh, uh, appropriate um, uh, ML algorithms that explicitly take into account network constraints, bandwidth, and delay? And can we further improve performance by not only focusing on communication, but also taking into account computation, compression, coding, et cetera? All right, another uh, big question and happens a, a lot in sort of distributed inference is that uh, you have this notion of stragglers. So firstly, let me explain that many uh, you know, uh, machine learning problems uh, have been uh, seen benefit by distributing them over many, many servers. But a big problem if you talk to, for example, Facebook or Google uh, or Microsoft, is this notion of stragglers. These are the servers that have that are very, very slow. Uh, and so the tasks are reported to, uh, you know, the, to, 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 to the sort of the distributor of, of, of these machine learning tasks in with a substantial delay. So basically the idea is that these tasks can get slowed down by servers that might be overloaded, they might be rebooting, or they might have low link delay in an XG network. And these stragglers, because they come late, can substantially impact the performance uh, of the machine learning tools themselves. And so there are many practical solutions that have been proposed, but they have significant limitations. And because of these limitations, an entirely new area has come into being called coded computation. Uh, which allows the final results of this distribution to be recovered, you know, not from all the tasks, but from a subset of the completed task. The problem is that coded computation is really a research area that's primarily worked on by information theorists. And so they don't, un they don't understand delay. They understand uh, uh, you know, compression very well. They understand coding very well. And so while they resolve the straggler problem, each of the individual distribution of these ML tasks have a certain code that's put into them that basically makes the parallelization more complex. So all you've done is taken a pro take, you've know, solved one problem, but you've incurred a problem at the other. And so a big open question is, can coded computation take into the account the structure of the machine learning problem, for example, sparsity, uh, and be adaptive to this heterogeneous edge? And here sort of there is some very exciting preliminary work in exploiting sparsity for code design that indeed answers the question in a preliminary way with yes, but of course, much more work needs to be done. So <laughs> thrust six now is about not only considering the network constraints, but also re-engineering uh, the networks that can adaptively allocate resources based on the needs of the distributed AI applications. So here you have you know, the opportunity to design network operations 
for managing both AI uncertainty as well as uh, network side uncertainty. And then Thrust 7, as I said earlier, is, is, is about the interface between humans, AI, and networks. And the motivation for this thrust is very simple. While all of us would love to have fully automated systems, the reality is that humans are going to remain a critical component in this complex systems for a long time. And Thrust 7 is really about how do you develop new collaborative methods across this human AI network spectrum to make the systems more efficient than they would be by either humans or machines themselves. Uh, <clears throat> the last uh, thrust, which is, uh, 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 you know, certainly last but not least, I don't want to, you know, kind of uh, uh, diminish its importance, is about making sure that users' privacy is preserved to the level specified. Because as these ML applications become more and more distributed, privacy concerns are going to become uh, more and more important. And so your, can we design and control these networks such that they're privacy aware, you know, differential privacy, which is a very, very important and, and fast growing area where you might have some kind of noise to ensure that, you know, users data is private, even though it's being shared. Uh, uh, can you do this in a, you know, in a, in a systematic, perhaps even a, a rigorous fashion in order to facilitate protection from information leakage uh, and attacks, especially when you don't have trusted curators, where you cannot trust a, an intermediate party to sort of resolve the privacy uh, issues for it. So this is a very exciting and important area in, in distributed AI. All right. So to summarize the first half, there are lots of fun and exciting problems that exist at the intersection of AI and networks. These should keep us engaged for a long, long time. However, I want to tell you a story from World War II that I hope clearly explains why context matters with data and data should be used very, very carefully. So in World War II, uh, the Royal Air Force, the British RAF, lost many, many planes to German anti-aircraft fire and decided that we need to armor these planes. But then they asked the question, where should you put the armor? And you know, the engineers <coughs> said, look at the data. And indeed, you know, they came up with a very obvious solution. They looked at planes that returned from the missions. They counted up all of the bullet holes and put the extra armor in areas that had the most bullet holes. So this seems like a very logical solution, seems like the correct solution, but in fact, it was wrong. So anyone wants to take a guess as to why, you can unmute yourself. Actually, they can write uh, questions, uh, they can respond via the Q&A, they are not oh. allowed, sorry to present. That's oh, fine, sorry. all right, okay. All right, so, so let, me, let me explain why it was wrong then. The idea was that if a plane made it back safely, even though it had lots of bullet holes, say in the wings, it basically pointed to the fact that bullet holes in the wings are not that dangerous. So in fact, you don't want to armor up areas that have holes, but you want to armor up areas that do not have holes, like the engine. Why? Because planes with holes in engines never made it back. Right? So this is sort of an example of why it's so important to use and interpret data carefully. And this is where domain knowledge plays an extremely important role. Okay. All right. <clears throat> So now let's discuss a case study where designing new machine learning tools can play a significant role, uh, that of edge caching. Okay. So edge caching is critical for a variety of uh, edge applications and use cases. For example, in autonomous transportation, we may want to you know, cache geographic or congestion or environmental you know, accidents, uh, construction, et cetera, information at nearby edge caches for vehicles to make fast decisions. 
uh, <clears throat> for intelligence education or personalized education, uh, we want to cache education materials, let's say, based on users' interests to support faster data retrieval. And for edge computing, we may want to you know, cache pre-computed uh, 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 data, for example, product embeddings for recommendation services in order to accelerate computation. So clearly edge caching is, is important, but there are very different challenges at the edge versus the core, right? If you look at the core, the core uses conventional caching policies such as least recently used, which will not work well in the at the edge because they are focused more on the most popular items, most recently uh, uh, used items. And in, in edge devices, typically you serve a small group of users that have highly individualized and dynamic demands that are not seen at the core. So if an item, let's say a music video or something like that is requested recently at the edge, it's unlikely to be requested again, unlike at the core. So your ML can be used for addressing these challenges by you know, developing uh, efficient caching solutions uh, uh, to, you know, by predicting individual demand dynamics and appropriately adapting uh, uh, the edge uh, of the cache contents. The other, uh, 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 you know, uh, di cha difference between the edge and the core is that edge caching performance is often impacted by other system components, such as, you know, storage layers from the edge to the core in a very complex and implicit way. And so key question is how do you you know, determine this implicit impact and develop caching solutions accordingly. And that's going to be the focus of the next, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. All right. So let me <clears throat> begin by just introducing you uh, the notion of a content delivery network. There are multiple cache layers, you know, uh, the edge caches that, you know, closer to the users typically have a smaller capacity, but also correspondingly small delay. The intermediate caches have larger capacity and larger delay. And the backend storage are these very, very large uh, caches that can potentially you know, cache the entire data set, uh, uh, but have the largest delay. And typically, if you look at a Facebook type of a, of a uh, um, you know, or meta, I guess, uh, type of a company, you will find you know, on the order of hundreds of edge caches okay, that are connected to an intermediate cache and tens of intermediate caches are connected to a backend data storage. So this animation just shows you what happens when you're trying to serve a data request in a content delivery network. So once a user generates a request, if it's stored in the edge cache, uh, uh, you know, uh, then there's a cache hit, you serve it with a small delay. If there's a cache miss, if it's not in the edge cache, you try to serve it from the intermediate cache. And then if of course it's not in the intermediate cache, you go all the way to the backend storage. And for the purpose of this talk, I'll assume that all of the data is always available at the backend data storage, okay? So <laughs> why is the edge caching problem challenging? Because the delay of fetching the miss data, which we will in the future call miss costs, depends very much on where the data is stored, whether it's in the intermediate cache uh, or the backend cache. But whether a data item is stored in the intermediate cache is not really known to the edge cache because the cache contents of intermediate caches are not only dependent on the data request from a particular edge cache, but from hundreds of edge caches. Okay? So essentially in this scenario, the missed cost of a data item is really unknown to the edge cache and unknown to the, to the end users. So a new challenge here is how does one use or develop machine learning tools to strategically estimate the miss costs and use them to design efficient edge caching policies is something which is not considered at the core. Okay. So let's say that our overall goal 
is to minimize the overall missed costs. If you knew this missed cost and you knew the popularity distribution, then the optimal policy is very, very simple. You cash the item that has the largest product of the popularity of that item times the missed cost. But for unknown missed costs, there has been a lot of heuristic solutions developed in uh, the systems literature, you know, most notably this paper on hyperbolic caching and Usenix, where essentially what they do is they estimate the missed costs by taking the average of previous observations of the missed items, and then they cache the items that have the largest product of the popularity times the estimated missed costs. But there's a key issue with this heuristic solution. It ignores the impact of caching decisions on estimating the average cost uh, in the future. So what it does from a learning parlance point of view, if you kind of know a little bit about machine learning is that you only exploit, it's a greedy solution, but you do not explore. And this can result in substantial suboptimality. In fact, we will show that this heuristic solution has actually a linear uh, regret, which is quite bad in terms of performance. So let's look at an example, uh, which sort of gives you a little bit of a deeper idea into the problems uh, with the heuristic solution. So let's say <coughs> we have two data items, D1 and D2. They have equal probability. The, you know, so the popularity is the same. The edge cache has a capacity of one. And let's say the missed cost is two if the item is served from the intermediate cache, and it's 10 if the item is served from the backend cache. And as we mentioned earlier, since the cache content of the intermediate cache changes over time, let's say the sample cost is as follows. For item D1, for the first two time slots, it's in the intermediate cache, and then it's always in the backend cache. For item D2, it's always in the, I mean, it's 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 in the intermediate cache, I mean, in the backend cache for the first two items, and then always in the intermediate cache. Now, if you use this heuristic solution, what will you do? Based on the first two observation, you will cache item D2 because its estimated cost of D1 is two and the estimated cost of D2 is 10. So you wanna basically, you know, use the, uh, the, the one with the larger cost and put it in, in the edge cache. But the problem is in the future, the, the script is reverse and the heuristic solution will never replace D2 by D1 since D2 is already cached and its future missed costs will not be observed. And the estimated missed costs of D1 are always less than 10 because the average of this, no matter how far you go, will always be less than 10. So, <clears throat> This kind of gives you an idea of why this heuristic solution is, is so suboptimal. So in designing a policy, there should be this natural exploration, exploitation trade-off, uh, which is critical in machine learning and online learning uh, 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 algorithmic development. So our solution that I'll show will be guided by online learning principles that will balance the trade-off by adaptively learning the missed cost of each item. And it's closely related to something called the combinatorial stochastic multi arm bandit problems. But as I'll show later, uh, there are some new challenges beyond conventional CMAB that one needs to uh, address. All right, so let's quickly <clears throat> go over the model. Let's say I have a set of M data items, D1, through DM, these all have unit sizes. And let's say that my edge cache is K, of course it's much less than M. I'm looking at a discrete time system. And at each time slot T, there is a data request R of T. Uh, and let's say that it's you know, generated according to some popularity distribution, which for the purpose of this talk, let's say is known uh, later on, talk about how this could easily be generalized. And then the cost to serve this item depends on where it's fetched from. If it's fetched from the edge cache, we assume it's, it's zero. You can make it C, some CE, it won't change anything except make the, uh, the equations a little bit more complicated looking. It's CI if it's served from the intermediate cache and it's CB 
if it's served from the backend cache. The only thing you wanna know is that the cost of getting it from the backend cache needs to be greater than the cost of it from the intermediate cache, which needs to be greater than the cost from the edge cache. Now, the caching decision, as I've said before, uh, of the intermediate cache is not known at the edge cache because it depends on what's going on at many, many uh, uh, different edge caches. And so at time t, let's say qi is the probability that item di is not stored in the intermediate cache. And gamma i is the expected missed cost for this item, which is given by this simple equation. And let's assume without loss of generality that we've kind of ordered these items d1 through dm such that the product of the expected missed cost gamma i times this popularity is decreasing uh, with respect to i. And remember that all items are always available in the backend cache. And this could simply mean that we have multiple backend caches and they're all available in any of them. So the system goal is to <laughs> minimize the expected accumulated missed cost or the delay for edge caching. And so if you look at a policy pi, the expected missed cost achieved by caching for that policy is given by the expected cost of cash of, of getting it from the intermediate cash plus the expected cost of getting it from the backend storage. And if you knew the missed cost probability, then the optimal policy is static. As I said before, you always basically cache the one that has the largest product. So in this particular case, you always cache the first key item since the product of PI times gamma I is decreasing. The key challenge is what do you do when these QIs, these missed costs are, are unknown? And you basically need to adaptively learn them and update the cache content and then decide whether or not to sort of you know, serve a particular request uh, and load it into the edge cache if it's not already cached and which data item to evict if the edge cache were full. All right, so this basically shows the connection between our edge caching problem and the stochastic combinatorial multi-arm bandit problems. There are lots of similarities, but there's a very important difference. And this is why one has to design new machine learning tools to handle the specific constraints of your problem. The key difference here is that the addition, there are additional constraints on the action sets for edge caching. So caching decisions at time t in our problem depend not only the request at time t, but also caching decisions at time t minus one, while the action set in the traditional stochastic combinatorial multi unbanded problem at time t can be arbitrarily selected. So we cannot directly apply existing analysis to the edge caching, and we need to come up with a new solution. So what we do is we <clears throat> basically uh, propose a, what is known as a coolback lieber lower confidence bound or KLLCB based uh, edge caching uh, uh, policy, where what we wanna do is we wanna compute this QI tilde, which is an estimate of, of this uh, uh, missed cost at time T, which is all initially set to be zero. And at each time T we calculate essentially the sample mean of QI, uh, all right? So we first do that. And then this estimate QI tilde of T, uh, we calculate it as, as the lower confidence bound based on the sample mean. So it's a function of this. And the reason why we are doing underestimation of this QI, so we are using a lower confidence bound, is we are want to encourage exploration Okay, we want basically not to be fixed on a greedy solution, which could come uh, and, and, and be problematic for us in, in the future. And that's the key idea basically of, of this scheme. So then we will update the cache content by this gamma i, which is the estimated missed cost, which is a function of this estimated QI of tilde. So if I, let's say if, if item di arrives uh, uh, at time t, that's the request. If, the, if this item is stored in the edge, edge cache, we don't need to update it at all. However, the policy is that 
If it is not stored in the edge cache, you load this item DI into the edge cache. If the product of its popularity times this gamma I, the estimated missed cost is greater than the product of the popularity of any item currently in the cache. And then you look and see if the cache were full, you have to evict a particular item. So you basically evict the item that has the smallest product of the popularity times the estimated missed costs. That's basically the algorithm. Okay? And the performance metric uh, that we evaluate the algorithm with is called the regret. So the regret of any policy pi over time horizon n is simply the cost of that policy minus the cost of the optimal policy, knowing full information, like, you know, as if you were God, you knew the full information. So in this particular case, the optimal policy would be the policy with the known QIs, where the optimal policy is very simple. You always cache the first K data items based on the estimated missed cost. So it turns out that you can write this regret with a little bit of algebraic manipulations in terms of the expectations of TI out and TI in, where TI out basically corresponds to the duration of time when item DI is not stored in the edge cache, and TI in corresponds to the duration of time when item DI is stored uh, in the edge cache. And so we have two key theorems. The first one is the regret upper bound. So for example, for our proposed KLLCB caching policy, we can show that our regret basically is logarithmic and we are able to find the constants, okay? So we basically show that the regret of our policy at most is diverging from this optimal, you know, godlike policy uh, logarithmically in time, okay? And then we show that no other caching policies can actually do better than our policy as, in, as the time horizon goes to infinity. So this basically shows that the KLLCB based edge caching policy that we develop is asymptotically optimal. And unlike the heuristic solution, the difference between the optimal and, and, and our policy is logarithmic, while the difference between the heuristic solution being optimally diverges linearly, has linear regret. I don't have time to go over the proof, but basically what we need to show is that, you know, these two terms in red are equal to each other. And I'll sort of skip all of that in the interest of time since we are kind of running late. This basically shows some numerical results where you have the heuristic, as you can see, it has linear regret while our policy has logarithmic regret. So this is for a fixed, you know, popularity distribution. This is for a popularity distribution, which is more in line with what we see in real web caching situations. For example, Facebook's photo caching. Once again, you can see our regret is going very slowly while that of the heuristic is blowing up. Um, and here <coughs> it's with the ZIF distribution, but it's unknown to us. Remember, when I initially kind of gave you the, 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 the results, they were for knowing the popularity distribution, but we really didn't, don't need to know it. We can estimate it by the sample mean in our KLLCB policy. And once again, you can see that our policy uh, uh, does much, much better. All right, this just shows that the policy is asymptotically optimal, which coincides with our theoretical results. So what are some of the takeaways? The first takeaway, is that underestimating this uh, QI, this you know, missed cost, will encourage exploration and avoid the issue of the heuristic solution. And using this KLLCB based underestimation, we are able to show that this optimizes the amount of exploration that you need and it appropriately balances the trade-off between exploration and exploitation in order to achieve asymptotically optimal regret. And the solution is generalizable already in many different directions. If you don't know the popularity, you can estimate the popularity through our uh, algorithm. Uh, if you have non-identical item sizes, that's also handleable. You can cache the data items that has the largest uh, product of this probability is divided by the item size. That works as well. So bottom line, ML techniques can be developed and be sharpened to substantially improve edge caching performance. 
Of course, like anything, we've scratched the surface of this problem. There are many, many different directions to look into. You know, for one, how does one jointly optimize edge and intermediate caching when you have limited and delayed information exchanges? How do you generalize the proposed solution when you have time varying popularity distribution? So you have non-stationarity. Uh, here we can use some work that we have done in non-stationary learning in, in, in order to you know, solve this problem. Uh, a big question is how do you efficiently implement the KLLCD policies in systems that have small computation overhead, especially when this QI probability is not Bernoulli, uh, because in that case, the form of this estimate using low, the lower confidence, you know, Kuhlbeck, Lieber, lower confidence bound is becomes a little bit more complicated. So here one can use potentially this technique called boosting. We have some works in, in, in this area in order to accelerate uh, uh, the performance. <clears throat> so anyway, lots of questions. I'll sort of uh, leave you with this. And uh, uh, you know, since there is going to be a, a follow-up uh, uh, discussion uh, for young researchers, I sort of wanted to point you to two uh, 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 links I have. Uh, some career advice and philosophical musings on a couple of keynotes that I gave at NSF for young career scientists. And also I have a, a, on my website, you can uh, uh, Google this and you can get uh, you know, some ideas about how to do PhD research, some elements of excellence, which I think are useful both for me as an advisor and also uh, I hope for the students. So welcome to this. And with that, I'll, I'll stop here and thank you very much. Thank you, Ness. Excellent talk. And uh, I'm sure uh, the audience appreciated your ideas and your directions. We have some questions. Uh, let me go through them. Uh, Reinhard Schultz from ITU is asking, do you, on your initial slide, slide six, you mentioned that researchers should focus on the wireless edge. Doesn't a lot of innovation also have to happen in the fixed network in order to deliver future or futuristic XG services? I muted myself. <laughs> um, yeah, so the answer is that you certainly, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that you should limit yourself to the edge, but if you are sort of looking for the biggest bang for the buck, that's where the innovations will have to happen because uh, the core of the network, and I'm talking about, you know, the real core of the network for many, many years, there have been so many uh, techniques that we have provided that can substantially improve the performance at the core, and they have not been adopted. And the reason why they've not been adopted is because there is too much uh, standardized legacy systems. And these are, you know, the, the, the inertial mass to change these solutions is very, very strong. Uh, you know, the, the core of the network, the focus is how do you switch, you know, how, how do you take the inputs and switch them to the outputs as fast as possible? And this has, at least for the last you know, couple of decades, uh, that's been sort of the mantra at the core. Uh, so certainly many of the applications that we design will of course have to be, may have to run on the core as well. Uh, but I think the, 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 the biggest bang for the buck in terms of innovation uh, is happening at the edge. On the other hand, if you are a you know a researcher that's working of the com at at companies that uh, you know look into the core or sort of you know own the own parts of the core of the network, uh, then it's certainly very valuable to sort of you know uh, push them push these companies to do innovations at the core because you can certainly make uh, you know big big changes there as well and maybe with quantum networks and quantum computation happening perhaps the core will eventually have to have to change as well. Yeah. So oh, it was that, not even oh, more, it's more of a preference kind of that's, that would be a long way to go, right? For the quantum yeah, networking definitely to place. Long, Very long, long, long way to go. Long way. Yeah. So there is another question by Reinhardt. 
a mm -hmm. network operator mentioned in a recent talk that they will sacrifice accuracy of machine learning models if they could instead have more explainability of why machine learning makes certain decisions. I was somewhat surprised at first because thought accuracy of predictions is what one will care the most. Can you comment on this? I'm really sorry, I'm outside now. So there is some background noise. No, I no, no, no worries. I, I can hear you perfectly, Ian. Okay, um, perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think explainability is important. Uh, 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 the question, I think, is uh, is is more about uh, uh, you know uh, you know sort of the uh, uh, you know the amount of 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 sacrifice that you're willing to uh, um, you know make. Right. So, you know, in, in terms of performance. So, uh, again, I'm surprised that actually a, uh, uh, you know, a, a company individual is, is basically saying that they're willing to sacrifice performance for explainability. But I can understand it to some extent, because I think the problem is the following. I think if you don't understand what is going on with the machine learning algorithms, if you cannot explain them well, it is quite possible that you may end up with an unsafe action, which while giving you good average performance can result in catastrophes from time to time. So I, I suspect that that's probably what that person was, 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 was worried about. Uh, there are some more questions. Sure. Anji Guo is asking, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I agree for the edge caching problem. Did you consider the correlation between data items when a user requests data item D1, for example, then most likely the next request will be the data item with high correlation to D1? Yes. Good question. I like it. Bravo. Yeah, very good question. And in fact, remember in the edge caching scenario, I I, I had I kind of put two questions, two sort of open challenges, right? So one was essentially the the this implicit uh, characterization that I focused on for this talk, and the other was personalized demands. And in the in the in the former work, we've done some work where we've actually looked into uh, this question of correlation. It's a very important one. Yeah, it's it's yeah. And uh, you know, you, you this is also an issue about spatial and also temporal correlations right that would be good to look from the joint perspective right yes absolutely correlations yeah, yeah. yeah. and th th these are yeah. open questions that i think one should definitely look sure at. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there is also a question by shah hosseini mm -hmm. uh, could you please comment on what is the simulation flat platform for edge caching oh the simulation platform for edge caching just sort of our own internal simulations that we that we did. So we had some event-driven simulations that were designed by the students. Okay, are there more questions while I'm waiting? Uh, let me ask you also, like I'm interested in these uh, metaverse applications and that's also very important, uh, you know, like have you have very large volume of data and you need to decide where to do these uh, point cloud compression at the edge or at the at the end, you know, at the source, and uh, so you are talking about like optimal policies, especially for caching, right? And uh, so, what is the take? You mentioned about what are the your you know delivering messages, but my question is, uh, you do a lot of analytical work, which is really solid and excellent, you know, since many decades. Now the question comes about the practicality. So like, can you know, companies uh, utilize these uh, uh, analytical results and somehow deduce what they should do in terms of, you know, edge caching, like, uh, and, and all these edge intelligence. Yeah. So can you please uh, explain it to us? Yeah, and in, in fact, so the, so the interesting thing is that the edge caching problem was actually motivated through an internship that my student did. Uh, uh, in, in a in a in a in a uh, in a caching company, uh, all oh. right. And so, so the problem was very real, and uh, they were very very interested uh, in 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 seeing simple. So even though our analytical work has a sort of theoretical kind of uh, a heft, the end solution is actually very simple. 
right? So it's it's a very sort of implementable uh, uh, policy. That's that's I think what we should all be striving for. So I think it's a very good question, right? So it's no point in doing complicated analysis and then coming up with a complicated solution that nobody will use, right? You want to come up with a solution that's that's useful. Yeah. I and uh, I assume that you will also develop some AI machine learning boosted solutions, right? In your yes. projects, right? That's the center. Uh, yeah. Are there any other questions or? There was one by uh, Reinhard. I think he says, uh, "If you yeah, look at another the, one, yeah, yeah, the very last one." Do you want me to I read it? That, yeah. Uh, wait a second. It's he, in the chat, Ian. Uh, yeah, no, the chat. It's in the chat. Okay, I'm going there now. Okay. Time. Okay. One more. Oh wow, Reinhard is active today. Time scales differ a lot in a network from parameters that change on an annual time scale to parameters that change on a millisecond time scale or faster, even nanoscale, you know, depending on the use case, right? Would you say that the shorter the time scales, the more limited the use of machine learning? Um, it, it depends. So for example, depends on what machine learning tools one uses. So if one uses, for example, let's say deep neural networks or things like that, where you have to do a lot of training, uh, then the answer is yes. Uh, if, on the other hand, you use, you know, online learning tools uh, 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 where, you know, that are that are data rich, then even if the time scales are short, as long as you're getting enough samples in the short time scales, then you can you can do things uh, which might be interesting. So I think it depends. Okay, I think uh, that's enough now. Q and A, and I I thank you again from the bottom of my heart, Ness. Again, you delivered an excellent talk as usual. And I uh, will let Alessia take over and ask sure. you her questions. Absolutely. So again, I look forward to seeing you. Okay, we'll be in Likewise. touch. Thank you. <laughs> Likewise, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much, Ian. Thank you for yeah. moderating. Thank you very much, Professor Shroff, uh, for this very informative session. I would like uh, to move to the um, Wisdom Corner. So live life lessons. Uh, which is based upon the idea to give a unique and special angle to this uh, webinar series. Uh, so successful researchers like uh, Professor Shroff today uh, will share with us uh, some lessons learned over the years and, that, and uh, they will guide uh, young students, young researchers uh, in the field of current ICT research. So I would start with, uh, with the first question, uh, Professor Shroff, which is your hard earned life lessons or failure, if we can call it this way, that you would like to share with us today that might perhaps be useful for um, the participant attending? Sure. Uh, so I, I, I guess what I would probably say is that, you know, uh, uh, never let anyone else define what you should and should not work on. Uh, so often, Sometimes, especially when I was a young researcher, you know, people would say, oh, you know, famous person X worked on this problem and has not solved it. How will you? Right. And that's a very discouraging message. Uh, uh, but usually it comes, uh, I found, from uh, critics who are maybe well-meaning, uh, but really have not accomplished anything of significance. And so my own feeling is breakthroughs happen because you believe in yourself, you believe in the problem, you believe in, in a mission, and that could take a lot of time. Uh, uh, so so it's, it's, it's something that you, you just have to, uh, you know, ignore the noise and basically do. And I'll, I'll give a very sort of, a, 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 you know, a concrete example uh, where I had this exchange with a student uh, where he was a brilliant student who was uh, actually now a famous professor in his own right. Uh, and I had given him a problem, which basically was an open problem. And, you know, this was a very smart student. And each week he would come and tell me, uh, Professor Shroff, I don't think this problem can be solved because of X. And I would say, um, you know, uh, this is a very thoughtful uh, 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 rationale, but in fact, you've made this small uh, uh, error in your in your logic, and therefore, I still don't believe that the problem can't be solved. And so we went back and forth with this week after week. He would come up with another reason why the problem couldn't be solved, uh, and it took a year. And then in the end, he was so fed up of me telling him 
that the problem you know uh, can be solved and 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 kind of you know giving him counter examples for his message that he eventually just did it and solved it so the point that i'm trying to make is that uh, you know, uh, if I was to sort of, you know, believe from the very beginning, uh, you know, that, uh, that this open problem couldn't be solved, I wouldn't have persevered that hard with the student, right? So I think that's that's really important. Just, you know, uh, if you really love what you do, you know, you, you take the time to do it. And sometimes you're successful, sometimes you're not. But that's the game of research. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So second question, uh, uh, which strengths and, and capabilities uh, you believe that uh, that students uh, should be most focused on uh, developing and how would you suggest uh, that they accomplish this? Yeah, uh, great question. So the first and most important thing is choosing a good problem. You know, a problem that will have a significant impact either in theory, if that's your interest, or in practice, if that's your interest. Uh, uh, and, and so this is very, very important. You, you, you don't want to waste your time working on incremental problems just because you can publish one more paper. Okay, so that's, that's the one thing. So choosing a good problem is important. And if you look, uh, oftentimes being the first actually makes it easier to have a big impact, right? So, I mean, if you, you know, if, if you look at, uh, uh, you know, uh, some of the researchers, you know, if they have been first, they've been able to make a big impact and move on. So oftentimes, you know, looking for, for problems where you are the leader and not the follower uh, uh, is, is, is important. Uh, the other thing is, you know, be willing to move out of your comfort zone. Try new things every few years. You know, you basically, uh, you know, if you've been working your entire life uh, on just one class of problems, you haven't really, uh, you know, learned anything new after a little while, right? So I think what you want to do is from time to time, be willing to change your fields and, and move into to, to different areas. And most important for young researchers is learn to communicate effectively, because you really are the most important advocate of your work. And, and it's amazing, you know, we, we see a lot of papers that are technically not good, uh, that somehow get a lot of visibility because they have uh, communicated their ideas well. And then you see the reverse as well. You see papers that are technically outstanding that almost nobody pays attention to because the way in which the message is communicated is very poorly done. Yeah, very clear. Thank you. And specifically, in which fields uh, and uh, which topics would you recommend students to study? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, it would really be foolish for me to sort of, you know, tell people what they should do. But I think what, what my suggestion is, find the area that excites you the most. Because mm -hmm. we right now are living in very exciting times. There are so many grand societal problems that we can contribute to, whether it's in big data and AI or sort of applications like self-driving, intelligent transportation, automation, unlimited clean energy, healthcare, virtual reality, quantum, you know, the list goes on and on. So my suggestion is find something that really excites you to work on and then go for it. Oh, thank you. And and we talked about some some hard learned uh, lessons, but uh, tell us one of your uh, most tangible contributions that you believe had an impact, a direct impact on your life or on others' lives that you are very proud of. Thank you. Uh, that, you know that question is a bit like asking you know which of your children you like the best. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but perhaps if I sort of think about it, you know, our work on opportunistic scheduling might have had the most impact since, since 3G wireless systems, these opportunistic scheduling algorithms are now part and parcel of every phone. So whether it's 3G, 4G, 5G, 6G, they will remain. So that's probably, I guess, the most impactful if I was to pick one. Uh, uh, but I would say that, you know, I've, I've enjoyed working on a vast variety of, of, of problems so that I, yeah, yeah. 
I can imagine. Actually, um, I remember that one of your, your la probably last slide of today's presentation, um, you gave us some links. I will definitely uh, look at them for the material of interest for young researchers. And the first one is a career advice and philosophical musings. I'm, I'm pretty interested in, in these philosophical musings by you. If you can share even one with us now. <laughs> Uh, so, you, you know, uh, one that comes uh, to, to your mind like that. Oh, um, I I think that uh, you know, uh, as I as I mentioned right earlier, right. I think I think the most important uh, aspect of doing research, and I think the one that gives us the most pleasure, is if we really do something that we ourselves are excited about. Right, because let's face it, we are in a field that's not. We are not becoming multimillionaires. We are not sort of, you know, this is not our goal, right? If if that was our goal, there are many other things that one can do. Uh, so make sure that whether you're doing it for a PhD or make sure that you know whether you're doing it for your career, do something that you really love and do it your way, right? Don't be a clone of anybody else, you know. Uh, you know, you know, don't be a clone of the of the greats. Don't be a clone of uh, your advisors. Don't be, you know, just do it, you know, in your in your own way. You know, find what you are really good at and sort of do it that way. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. Just last one, I promise. Just to close, if you can share with us if you have in your mind a motto, an aphorism, or or like a book that you loved, a piece of art or music that you would like to share with us that represents you. Yeah, so I guess I sort of you know led led to that. Maybe Frank Sinatra's "I Did It My Way." <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's wonderful. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it has been a pleasure to have yeah. you as our speaker for this webinar today. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you, Ian, for being with us today. Thank you, all participants. And uh, do you wanna do you wanna share probably Ian some final words? Yes. Uh, again, uh, thanks, Alessia, for leading this uh, life lessons uh, session. And again, I thank you, Ines, for this excellent technical talk. And I'm sure that uh, a lot of young researchers on the list get some stimulations to conduct research on this topic. And uh, uh, what I can say is, uh, Ness, keep up your good work. You always produce excellent results. And thanks again for joining us. And I ask everybody to submit their papers to our journal. And if you have any ideas for special issues, please do not hesitate to uh, submit your ideas for a call for uh, special issues. And uh, many people are writing uh, great comments about the uh, uh, webinar today, Ness. I'm sure you also read them here. And everybody say everybody says great talk and uh, and Professor Shroff looks the best. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, no, thank you again also to the audience. And uh, so and we'll uh, see you on the twenty second again online for another webinar yes. with Professor Medar from uh, MIT. Great. Yes. So we look forward to that too. We had always these uh, superstars in our webinars. And thank you and have a nice uh, day and night wherever you are. I will have a dinner here now in the market, fish market in Abu Dhabi. So thanks a lot. Thank yeah, you. Have, have thank a great dinner. Much. And uh, thank you, Alisa, for arranging everything. Uh, uh, it's been a real pleasure and uh, uh, looking forward to. Uh, you know, hearing from all of you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Ciao.